Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Lambda Lounge March. Um, this month, we're going to do some uh, lightning talks. And excuse me, I just have to close uh, the monitor on my left there. Um, and we, we have uh, some fantastic uh, talks for you today. Uh, we're going to have um, um, Dan talking about um, Rego, which is a prologue inspired uh, query language. Uh, we have Vite, who's going to be talking about the very exciting uh, glamorous toolkit and his work with that. Uh, I'm going to be doing a talk on functional bash. And then my, my colleague, Charlie, uh, will talk about um, a very exciting new and slightly more modern shell uh, um, uh, new shell and, and couch shell. So I'm going to uh, invite uh, Dan on to start. And um, we will take questions at the end of each talk. So if you have any questions, please do um, put them on uh, either Discord or um, or YouTube, and, uh, and and we'll try and give them uh, at the end of the talk. So uh, over to you, Dan. Thanks, Akeem. Um, right. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, Rego today. Uh, so as Hakeem said, Rego is a uh, declarative language, uh, sort of query language based on Prolog. Um, it's part of the uh, open policy agent. Uh, so it's, it's really a language designed for making assertions about data, um, uh, whether that data could be anything, structured data. It has a focus on sort of JSON inputs. Um, what I'm going to do in this quick talk is I'm going to give you a really, really fast lightning tour of the uh, basic language features of, of Rego. And then at the end, hope, I'm hoping to, assuming I don't run massively over time on that, take you through an example of using Rego policies to validate um, a Terraform plan, so some infrastructure as code. Uh, right, so lightning tour of the language. Um, Rego, you can get a Rego shell by installing the OPA toolkit and doing OPA run. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you just a basic sort of variable assignment type stuff. Um, you can see here that when I assign this KB variable to 1024, it tells me that a rule has been defined in this package. And a rule is sort of uh, a Rego concept. Uh, almost everything is a rule, essentially. Um, so you can have a, a rule which is a static value, like a variable, uh, like a, a scalar. Uh, also, you can have sort of structured data um, like this, for example. Um, and then uh, if I put that in there, it'll print out the contents of the, of the document. And again, in Rego speak. Um, uh, so this, the, this, this package currently contains those two rules. It's, it just sets up a new package when it starts. Um, now, these rules, these, these statements are defined sort of static documents. Um, so yeah, a scalar value or a, essentially a JSON document. Um, but the sort of the, the interesting um, sort of power of Rego comes in when you uh, define virtual documents. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to just, uh, first of all, I'm going to show you I have some static documents that I've predefined in a file. Um, which is this. I've added a couple more books. Um, and uh, I'm going to open a new shell. Um, and the minus B flag here just loads in uh, the data inside this basics directory into the REPL environment. Um, and then I can import my, my, my books here. So I hope you hope I put them out. There you go. You should see them. Um, uh, and now, now let's define a, a one of these "quote unquote" virtual documents. I'll explain a bit what I mean by that. Um, so, a virtual document in Rego is essentially uh, a, a, you can kind of think of it as a query in many ways. Um, so, I've called this one "has ubic," uh, and this is just uh, taking the set of books uh, I've defined in my data um, and filtering through them for one that has the title "ubic." Um, so, the syntax here is is sort of the the you have the name of the rule here, and then this, this, these, this bracketed expression defines some sort of statements that uh, effectively act as filters. So the very first thing here is that a book is simply a member of the collection of books. Uh, this underscore is just a placeholder variable for, for any kind of index of that books array. And then we're asserting down here that book title should be equal to ubic. Um, so if I enter that, it defines the rule. And if I evaluate this rule, 
um, it will check whether there is a book with that title in the collection. Um, you can also, so to give you an example of a, uh, of a virtual document which uh, won't find what it's looking for, we've got this has androids um, rule, which checks whether the whether do Android stream of electric sheep is in the collection of books. Um, and this returns, if I evaluate it, uh, it returns undefined, um, which is the sort of default state of, of, a, of a value in, in uh, uh, we go if it doesn't if none of the data that you're querying matches. Um, this is a very simple way to define sort of virtual documents. That just and the, these these things can have the value true or undefined. Um, but you can also create slightly more interesting virtual documents um, uh, with this kind of syntax. Um, so this actually defines a virtual set of document uh, a virtual document which it, which will look like a set. Um, and it's doing the same basic operation where it's iterating over the books, but it's filtering by the author this time. And then you can see here as well is that this bracket expression up here indicates that this rule defines a set of titles. We define title down here to be the title of any given book that matches. So hopefully if I just print that out, you'll get an idea of what I mean. Um, we, can, we can see that the, the books by us or Kayla Gwynn uh, match uh, and are being returned by this virtual, by this rule, which, which defines a virtual document. Um, these are also queryable, uh, these virtual documents. So I can do things like paste in Le Guin quote or diversity and it will return me the value that matches from that set. And if I try and put in a book that was not authored by SK Le Guin, I again get undefined. Um, so uh, that's the very, very basics of the syntax. Um, so I'm now going to give you, uh, take you on a whistle stop tour through an example of how that can be used to actually uh, validate some Terraform code. Um, so uh, in the Terraform directory here, uh, I've got a very simple instance definition, um, you know, as simple as it could possibly be. Uh, if you're not familiar with Terraform, all of this is doing is it's uh, saying uh, that it would, we'd like to create an AWS uh, instance named web using a, an Ubuntu AMI with this particular instance type in AWS. Um, uh, and if you run a plan and apply, then Terraform will go away and spin up that server behind the scenes, right? Um, so uh, I've also, though, got in here a policy directory, and this contains a few different uh, sections. Uh, I've got a utils uh, file here, which does some sort of parsing of the Terraform plan, which I'm not going to go into detail with because there's not really time. But just to show you the basic structure of the, the Rego uh, here, um, I'm filtering through all the resources here to get the EC2 instances. And the reason I want to do this is that, you know, so my company has a policy that we're only allowed to use T3 instances because um, other instance types are too expensive or whatever. Um, I've got this allowed family rule, which for any of the instances in EC2, it checks whether the instance type starts with T3. And then I've got a simple denial rule here as well, which is literally just the logical inverse of uh, allowed family. Not allowed family is uh, gives you all of the instances which don't have a uh, logistic family, so that are T3s. And at the top here, I've got this deny rule which um, prints out a little message uh, if anything is, is failing in this policy test. So if I look at my instance here, I'm just gonna show you a failing case first. So say that I decide that I want a C5X large instance. Um, I can run a wee plan. Oops. Oh, uh, I've just realized uh, I need to set my AWS profile. That's I might also need to and if I need to do yes. I thought I'd done this ahead of time. Right, let's try this plan again. Okay, cool. So we've now got a JSON version of this script outputs this JSON version of the plan, which this uh, Rego can understand. 
And then to evaluate it, we just do uh, OPA eval input tfplan.json uh, policy, and then we need the name of the rule, which is uh, terraform.deny, I think. Uh, oh dear. One moment. I, 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 okay, I've messed up this portion. Eight of the terraform of my is probably what I need to do. There we go. So Sorry, <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. Um, this OPA eval statement, uh, as you can see, prints out this little this little value, which is the message that we wanted to print out here, and it just tells you, informs you helpfully that the instance has type C5x large, and it says, please use T3. Uh, and if I change that back to T3, um, uh, T3, well, T3x large is fine. We can run the same eval again, uh, oh, except we need to plan first and evaluate it, and we can see that there are no denials, the jars are empty. Um, so that's the basic idea. Um, there are a couple of other neat features of, of OPA, such as it has sort of built in, in newer versions, it has built in support for tests uh, in a kind of quite sort of friendly, familiar syntax that will be common, familiar to anyone who's used Go, uh, Golang, um, similar sort of structure of, of testing. Um, and yeah, it's generally kind of, it's just a, it is a, it's a bit hard. It's, I think its main downside is that it's not necessarily super approachable, particularly to kind of people I work with who are more on the DevOps side of things um, and aren't necessarily familiar with sort of query languages in, in great detail. Um, but it has a lot of potential, I think, and it can be used to validate all kinds of things, any structured data, Terraform, uh, Kubernetes, Manifest, uh, anything you like. Um, so yeah, that's the lightning tour. Um, Thanks. Thank you very much, Dan. That was uh, that was fab. Uh, well, when I just looked through the questions, I wanted to ask you what's your favourite uh, Ursula Le Guin uh, uh, novel. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan. Oh, good. Uh, well, I I, I I like the Left Hand of Darkness a lot. Um, uh -huh. I, I I thought as you as you called her Ursula K. Le Guin that you might be more into the sci-fi uh, side yeah, of it. Yeah, I I, I I was always a fan I of Wizard of Earth. Yeah, I, uh, I watched the uh, Ghibli adaptation of, oh, wow. uh, of uh, whatever, um, whichever Earth scene or what was recently. And that's a very good watch if you haven't seen it. Oh, really? Okay, I, yeah, I, I yeah. thought all of the adaptations had been had been awful. Sam is asking, what about yeah. the Dispossessed? Um, I do like the Dispossessed as well. It's very good. And yeah. David is reading the Word for World is Forest, which I've had on 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 my that. bookshelf for years and never read. Yeah, uh, I haven't I haven't read that one either. Actually, yeah, um, yeah. It's just, I, 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 can Riga run against any JSON? Yeah, any any JSON, Sam. Yeah, so it's it's really a very sort of um, application agnostic uh, toolkit. Um, one of the, the like sort of textbook use cases actually to validate, as I said, it's kind of Kubernetes manifests. Um, you can run it. Um, there's a there's a tool called Gatekeeper, which is it's sort of built into. Um, but really, it's a yeah, it's a, it's a framework uh, for any kind of like policy checking. Um, it has really great docs, by the way. I didn't I didn't plug the docs um, for for o the OPA docs, but uh, the the website has um, uh, really really good documentation. So I encourage you to take an eye over it if you're interested. That's great. As a, as a technical writer myself, I'm very pleased to hear that. Mm. Uh, and then one, one final question before we move on uh, from right. Connor on Discord is, what have you personally used uh, Rego for yourself? So uh, my experience with it has been limited so far to um, some of uh, that sort of Terraform validation stuff. And actually, uh, to be fair, I haven't really used it sort of in anger on, uh, on um, I've sp I spiked it out at some point in January uh, as part of uh, my, current, my current contract that I'm working on. Um, but it hasn't really been fully rolled out yet. So okay, well that that that's perfect for like <laughs> and, uh, and and an open Indeed. invitation if you uh, if you ever uh, get um, uh, some war stories to tell about it. Um, mm, yeah. And actually, okay, ju just very quickly, one last question. Um, and uh, how well does it deal with large JSON docs? 
And again, if that's not something mm. you've come across, we can always get you. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. They the docs make some claims about it being very performant, but I haven't validated them. So, <laughs> fair enough. So if, if anyone has any questions uh, beyond that, then um, please do join us on, on Discord afterwards. And uh, uh, if, if the speakers aren't able to make it, we'll, we'll pass on any questions. But thank you very much, Dan. Uh, yeah, really enjoyed welcome. that. Looking forward to the rest of the talks. Take okay. care. And uh, I, I'm now going to um, introduce Veit, who some of you may recognize uh, from his previous talk uh, on CARP at Lambda Lounge. Hello, Veit. Hello, everybody. Lovely. And let me uh, uh, include your slides. And uh, over to you, Vite. Take care. All right. Hello, everybody. You should be able to see my glamorous toolkit now, which is GT, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm using a deaf version of the glamorous toolkit. Uh, before we start, I just want to make clear it, it, it looks a little no, it doesn't look different than what you get. But if you click on Git, I have all the repositories in here that are used to build it so I can push code to these repositories if I need to change anything. Um, that's the only thing that changes from a dev version to a production version, really, is that these repositories are gone in, in the version that you download from the website, which is gtoolkit.com. The other thing that I should probably mention before we start is that I work at Fink, which is the company that builds the Glamorous Toolkit. Um, it isn't really a product, so I'm not doing a product pitch right now. It is something we use um, as a consultancy to analyze um, other people's projects and products and software um, and and analyze just about everything about the company, but um, it's not in itself a product and it's free to download and it's open source and all of the good stuff. Um, and with all of that out of the way, I think I can start to talk about what it is. I think some people on the stream already know kind of in broad strokes what it is, but I'm, I'm going to start from basically nothing. Um, the Glamorous Toolkit is more or less uh, half of an operating system. Um, you have an IDE in there. You have uh, note-taking in there. You, the note-taking is a Jupyter Notebook style, so you can intermingle code. You can also um, add, I don't know, Twitter snippets. Um, our CEO actually uses it for tweeting. Um, you can browse files. You can do all kinds of fun stuff. It's also a slide renderer. It's a bug publishing system. Um, our docs live inside as a, a book that you can browse, right? And this is also the note-taking system again. And this starts to explain a little bit how it is. This It's a malleable system, or moldable, as it's called. Um, and that means that it should fit whatever use case we make it fit. Usually, that's analyzing software, but it doesn't have to be. And um, as a language, it uses Smalltalk, but it can it, it doesn't just work with Smalltalk. And because this is a functional um, meetup, I am, in the end, going to motivate you to explore functional programming with it a little bit um, through the lens of CARP in this case. But I'm also going to talk about how it can be used in other contexts. And uh, I just opened a little playground here so that we can, you know, look at some, some code that you might write and how you interact with code and how you write code and views in the uh, Glamorous Toolkit. So this is an integer and here is basically the, you know, read and eval portion and here is the print thing, right? And so I have a, a tabbed inspector and inspectors are something that are featured in every Smalltalk system and that I miss from just about any other system. So um, it's kind of like a live object inspector in that I can look at the self variable here, which is in this case, the only instance variable inside an integer, but I can also view, look at other views. And these views are just um, methods defined on the object that have a little pragma on there and uh, when I alt-click, option-click on it, then I can actually inspect what that 
what that method looks like. But this, this little pragma here, which is a way to annotate functions, will say, hey, make this, make this a view on the object. And so I can, I can do this with more interesting objects, which like a fraction, and, and now it, it gets a little more interesting, but I can even do it you know, with more complex objects and then it gets really fun, right? Um, I can then look at the color. And as I said, now I can, I can option click on that and inspect how is this actually rendered and how is this defined? And it's actually surprisingly little code. Then I can look at the class and, and browse the class and see and I can write my own code here because every class is extensible from everywhere. So I can just write my own views from anywhere and inject them into the system. Um, and you know, if I inspect an object, I can also here um, eval something in the context of the object. So self is bound to the color blue here. And if I add green, then I get cyan. And if I add red, um, then I should get magenta, and if I add magenta and red, no, and 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 green, right? Uh, then I should get white because then all the channels are set, and I indeed get white. So this is kind of you know how I play around with small talk code, and that's all well and good, um, but it's only half of the story because this is this is nice for developing small talk. This is interesting for developing small talk. But it's not really interesting for assessing software yet. Um, but I do want to get go off on a tangent because I wrote this little Git client um, a while back, and I, I'm not an UI, a UI person. Um, but we have this repository here that I added, which is the CARP parser and, and repository. And if you look at how this view is defined, these are actually just the same tabs that I have here. So if I inspect the actual object that's behind this view, I get the same tabs because they're just views like anything else. So what's cool about you know, writing views while you're debugging things, the views that you need, is that oftentimes these views are actually what you need once you go into production and build your actual user-facing UI. Those are often really, really useful UIs that you don't want to work. Uh, you don't want to just throw away. So that's just a tangent, but it is, I think, an important point that I want to drill home. And um, with that out of the way, let's talk about how to analyze code with it. So we have we have a little CARP parser, and it uses something called Smack, which um, maybe I should go off on another tangent actually, uh, which is that the CARP parser implemented in Smack has um, is you know, this is how you write parsers with the GT uh, Glamorous tool. It looks a little different from how you write regular classes. Regular classes have the methods in here and you can inspect methods and you can add methods. A parser, because it's a little bit different, has the grammar here. And, you know, you have little production rules here. And then um, you have the bigger, you know, uh, the bigger stuff here. I don't know what the term is actually. I just wrote my own first parser this weekend. But you know, and you have the the thing that actually maps to AST nodes in the end here. And I can actually take just about any of these rules and just say, hey, give me just this. And uh, you know, this is how a comment looks in CARP. And it actually validates. And I can say, oh, this doesn't validate. And I can do this for individual rules. I can do this for the whole grammar. And this is a context-independent code, uh, context-dependent coder, basically. So that's kind of, kind of useful when writing parsers. And you can imagine this kind of thing being useful for other things as well. So you can make context-dependent coders. So this is nice for multiple development, uh, and not just for um, small talk, I would argue, but you know, more on that later. In the meantime, what we're going to look at is, um, and sorry, that's a little tour de force, but really I said this is half an operating system and so we have a lot of stuff in here. Um, I will look at the the, the Lepiter um, kind of, that's I misclicked here, the Lepiter thing. And I have a few notes here. Um, namely this weekend I asked myself, hey, how would it be to work with uh, CARP in, in the Glamorous Toolkit? And wouldn't that be cool as a demo? 
Uh, and so I did. And two questions that I asked myself were, the first one is, um, that was actually the second question, but I'm going to go through it uh, first, was, hey, wh which things are defined statically and dynamically? So which things are available at macro time that are also available, but, in, uh, but in, implemented differently um, once the program is compiled? And static functions are implemented using defn, and dynamic things are implemented using defn dynamic. And so I define this, and then I say, hey, give me all the files in carp core, basically. This is what that is in home carp core. I have the standard library. I get all the files. And then um, I just filter them. This is basically a filter action for the functional programmers, select uh, by carp. And then I get uh, extension, then I get the carp files. Then I basically just get the static definitions, which is a set. And uh, for all the files, basically uh, parse the file, um, give me all the list nodes, which is um, how I write a definition in the end. And then in these list nodes, give me the thing where the first one is a variable and uh, the first value is defn. And then um, add those, basically. Add all of them in the file and do that for all the files. And in the end, you know, I have the set of all the, all the functions that are defined, all the function names. And then I do the same thing, but with the dynamics and I get all the dynamics and then I just take the set intersection. Right, and I have 46 things. That's nice. That's a nice thing to do, but it's also hmm, kind of boring because as soon as I have a parser, I can ask these questions. That I have a nice notebook environment is nice, but it would be even nicer if I could actually use the visualizing powers of the system. And so um, let's look at the other example, which is loading things. I want it to visualize which files in the static library load which other files. And these are the statements for loading. Include um, loading and load once, which is basically just ensure that this is only loaded once. And I evaluate this, and I evaluate the files again, and then I get the cart files and the C files this time. Right? And for the cart files, I do something very similar to what I did before. I parse the file, I get the list node, I take the thing where load is the first statement, and then I take the second thing um, and put that in a dict. And then I know that you know SDL has maybe a system include to math H. It, I don't care which of the load statements it is, just that it's in there. And so I have a mapping here. And for the C files, I, I could parse them, but it was a pain for me to figure this out. So I just said, well, the C files, they don't include anything. They just, they're, they're dead ends. C is dead end. And then I make a little, you know, a little view. And I know that here, for instance, um, this is the core file. And it makes sense because it includes all these other files. This is a horizontal tree view. And it's a little weird. So um, instead, what I could do is, well, uh, who implements this horizontal tree? Uh, it's the layout builder. It has a few other views as well. Hmm. So force is actually a force-based layout. And if you know that, then you might know that this might make more sense. So let's look at the force layout instead, render this, and we have a better layout, I think. Now we can see that, for instance, bench.carb includes carb bench and statistics, but it's not included by default. It's not in core file. And core includes standard int, which includes carb standard int.h. And binary includes card binary. And I'm guessing that these are not directional, not visually directional anyway. But I'm in, I am guessing that binary includes standard int. Um, all right. So I think that's kind of it. I want to show one last thing that's not related to how to analyze these things. Um, but before that, I want to also say that um, the Glamorous Toolkit does ship with parsers and better environments than the half-assed uh, CARP thing that I did this weekend for languages like Clojure and Elixir. So you might be interested in letting this run on, on your Clojure and Elixir code bases. Um, but something else came up uh, last week when someone mentioned that 
you have kind of a meta circular interpreter in there. And it's not quite true, but there is something fun here where if I option control shift click on things, I can, I can, I have, if you ever inspected something in the browser, I have something very similar here where I can select all of the, you know, the elements. And uh, if I go on that element, I have the same kind of drill down inspector that I had in here but about the view that is the Glamorous Toolkit. So I can do all the same things that I could do inside the Glamorous Toolkit about the Glamorous Toolkit and how it's rendered. And I can do this live as well. Um, and that's why it's, why it's important to keep this, this thing in a live environment and why it's so fun that it's dog fooded and all of it is kind of transparent to the user. Um, and I think that's kind of it. And if you want to explore some more, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I'm on the uh, Lambda Lounge Discord, and I'm also on the Carp. Uh, not I'm also on the Carp Discord, but also on the Glamorous Toolkit Discord. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, let me. Uh... There you go. Thank you very much, Vlad. That was that was great. Uh, I've got a couple of questions in from uh, from the chat. So, mm -hmm. is there a TypeScript parser? For Glamour's toolkit. Um, last time I checked, I think we only had a JavaScript parser. Um, I don't know whether it can parse TypeScript now nowadays. Let me just quickly check. The nice thing is we have like a spotlight like uh, search. So I can I can TypeScript parser. There it is. We have a TypeScript parser. I haven't uh, tested it, but it's there. Okay. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, and uh, a similar question, can it handle multi-language projects? Yes. Um, something that is fun that I didn't get to demo because it's kind of hard to set up more because multi-language things are hard to set up. But something that I enjoy is that the debugger can actually handle stack traces where Python is calling JavaScript, is calling small talk. So you can actually step through these things, through these frames, these multi-language things. It's more of a play thing because oftentimes those languages are separate. But yeah. Sorry. Uh, apologies for that. That uh, came in a bit early. Um, and I, I, I had one question um, for you as well, which is you, you mentioned a couple of times that uh, it was almost like an operating system. And d does that ever feel unwieldy like in, in the way that so I'm, I'm i'm a vim user and, and i love the idea of the power of emacs but i'm also a little bit off put by the fact people say it's an operating system how do you learn something so big do, do you right. find it um how, how do you balance that kind of sheer power with being usable as a day-to-day -day kind of editor and environment um so it's funny because i was a U vim user before as well and i still am when i'm in an environment where I am required to work in the shell um, or where the Glamorous Toolkit is just not the right tool because these things do happen. <laughs> um, so I, I, I see that point, but it it hasn't occurred. Like it, I really, it hasn't come up as much um, as I thought it would uh, just because also it is very transparent and I don't have to use everything. I can just use the pieces that I can use, and uh, I just pick up things as I go. Fantastic! Yeah, no, I mean, and 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 as a as a well, partly Vim user, I also use VS Code. Uh, as a Vim user, the fact that you um, are interested in in this idea and it hasn't made you scream and go back to Vim is high praise indeed. So that 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 sounds very interesting and very exciting. So uh, thank you very much, Veit. And again, it, uh, oh, hang on, we have one more question. I think we can, we have time for uh, from uh, Sam. Is there a plan to have interpreters in other languages in Glamorous Toolkit or use it as an ID for other languages? So if you um, go in the Glamorous Toolkit book, there are actually two notebook pages or book pages that let you execute JavaScript and Python. I think uh, experimentally for one uh, project, we added some Ruby, uh, specifically Rails, but those are the runtimes that we integrate. Mm -hmm. um, but others are possible. And they're certainly, th we don't actively work on any right now just because we don't have the need, but it's also 
completely feasible and easy to do it yourself. Um, so, you know. <laughs> Brilliant. So an uh, open invitation to our, our viewers. If anyone does anything exciting with Glamorous Toolkit in your language, then please come back and and, and do a talk about that. So uh, thank you very much, Veit. Uh, it, was, uh, it was great. Thank you. Take care. Um, and the, the next speaker uh, is going to be me. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, functional bash, of all things. Um, and uh, yeah, so... Functional bash. So um, here I've got a, uh, a bash window with uh, um, with a text editor on the on the left, and we can evaluate stuff on the right. And um, so a couple of people mentioned that they they were like, "What? What, what does that mean? Functional bash? It's a ridiculous idea." Um, and I, I, I didn't think it was because to me Bash is, has always been a, a sort of fairly functional uh, programming language, and um, you know you can do the kind of obvious things like um, uh, doing pipelines of, uh, of different commands. So we can take the standard word list and we can get the first 10 values of that. Or, you know, other simple example, we can do a grep, a filter for the words that begin with F and, and just show those. And we can also find out, well, how many words are there that begin uh, with the letter F? And you can even do that. That's using uh, the dash C um, um, flag for grep, but you can you can do it in a, in a much more sort of pipeline way by cutting the file and then um, searching for the things that begin with F and then running the word count program to see how many lines it is. And people complain about useless uses of cat, but I think that's actually reasonably elegant. You could you could just pipe um, words at the beginning and you get a similar pipeline without without the cat for those Unix purists. Um, and we can do other things like using the Unix um, uh, cut command to get the first four characters. We get a nice sort of column uh, of text there. Um, and we can we can create our own commands. So we could we could run this upper uh, uppercase command, which does some weird bash magic hieroglyphs. Doesn't matter. Uh, that that does uppercase things. So if we run upper.sh on hello lambda lounge, it uh, it shouts it out to the world. And now we can run that using exargs, uh, which basically runs a command for every line of uh, of input. And so we so we get it like that. But you can see here it's kind of batched them all up into one command line. So if we give it another flag, L1, we can get it into something that looks more like a kind of functional map command. Uh, and, and that's quite amusing because it is basically uh, higher order programming using passing a program to another program. And uh, there's a wonderful um, uh, paper here that I, I, I didn't have time to go into for this talk um, that basically proves the Gödel uh, incompleteness theorem using Bash as the example. And it talks about elite metaprogramming techniques, which I think is brilliant for something as old school as, uh, as Bash. So, um, there are some really exciting projects like um, uh, Bash Lambda that uh, that do sort of anonymous functions and garbage collection and um, currying and all of that stuff. I, uh, that may make a really good talk uh, for another time. I haven't gone into that uh, for this talk. Instead, um, I had an anecdote about um, a... Uh, sort of war story from when I worked at the BBC, and we obviously had terabyte scale databases of program information, that kind of thing. Um, and we wanted to move one of those out of the BBC's own data centers into the cloud where our team could, you know, hack on it without you know, DBAs and stuff uh, cramping our style. So so we installed MySQL. Uh, yes, I'm afraid we used uh, MySQL. My colleague, uh, Charlie, in a little bit, will talk about a real modern shell and a real modern database. Um, uh, and um, unfortunately, I contacted the BBC. They wouldn't give me their two terabyte database of uh, program data uh, just to play with for this talk. So I had to download um, a uh, test database um, made by uh, Giuseppe Maxia, um, good guy. Um, and um, you could essentially now just you, you get some SQL and you can you can run that in uh, in this import file, and so we did that essentially. We, we 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 ran something similar, and as you can see, it takes a bit of time. It takes a bit of time, and um, we did some calculations, and we eventually figured out that um, it was going to take around 
Well, here, if we go, well, that took 46 seconds. Obviously, it's that this is faked, um, but let's say it took 46 seconds. It's 170 megabytes. The actual database is two terabytes. That will take a whole lot of seconds. Insect is very cool. It's a calculator that uh, knows about units. Um, that's not very useful. Let's try that in hours. Got a lot of hours, so let's uh, do that in days because my mental arithmetic is terrible. Uh, so six days. So I, I think it was more. It might have been two weeks or something like that. So we went to our boss and we said, "Hey, uh, sorry, but." Uh, you know, we're going to twiddle our thumbs for a couple of weeks while uh, while this uh, uh, imports. So, what he suggested is, why don't you see if we can parallelize uh, this instead? So we had a look at the um, the uh, uh, file, and you can see there. Um, the export from MySQL comes out as a whole load of uh, SQL it, insert statements. And each of these files actually contains multiple uh, insert statements. Um, and you can see that they, they have, well, this one has 38 statements. Uh, each of them is a megabyte uh, big. And so if we split that out, we could try and in insert, you know, somewhere between one and 38 uh, at a time. And the database can, can work a lot faster in parallel. Um, so there are tools that actually do um, splitting of SQL, um, but you can also use something very dumb like uh, uh, the, the classic split command, um, which has a dash P uh, flag to take a pattern. So for example, we could um, split on anything that begins with the letters insert. And uh, if we run that, um, we can see that well, it does take a little bit of time. Um, Oh, that actually took more time than it usually does, uh, probably because I'm I'm streaming. Um, but uh, but what that does is it generates a whole load of these these files, um, and you can see that each of these files now starts with insert into. So each of them is a single insert statement, and. Um, essentially, what we figured out is that that would take a couple of days, actually. Possibly more if you think that that um, uh, that example there took uh, uh, so much time. And what we discovered is that the, the split command was reading the files very, very quickly, obviously. And then as it was writing to disk, because obviously writing to disk is much slower, that was where things were getting really blocked up. And of course, as well as the time, uh, it was also uh, taking up a whole lot of disk space. So if you think we had provisioned uh, some machines in AWS that would cope with a two terabyte uh, uh, database dump, now they had to be able to cope with at least four terabytes because we're getting a copy uh, of, of them or multiple copies of them to pass to MySQL. So if we just looked back at the file and actually just grepped through it and just found the um, the insert statements, you can see that that goes a whole lot quicker. So we began to have some evil ideas. Um, uh, so the grep statement has a dash B flag, which tells you the byte offset uh, within the file of the particular thing that it's found. And um, this will all come together in a bit. Uh, it has a, an H flag that gives you the name of the file that it's found. So if we got both of those and, um, and then we, um, we uh, just select the, uh, the first two fields, um, then we can get the, the name of the file and the um, the uh, the byte offset. So so th this is already a really good start. We can we can now locate uh, these things within the file. But what we want to do is also find the the ending of it. And so a really nice functional way of doing that would be to um, list the file, uh, but skip the first row, and then you can compare the two things at the same time. So if, if example, if I run that now, you can see that we get um, all of those, but you, you, you can trust me on it, um, not the first row. Of course, that means we, we don't have the, the ending of the file. So there's a stat uh, command here that will then give us the, the final byte offset. So you see there, that, that last one begins with 3.8. And when we run this now, it runs with three, it ends with 3.9. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that now looks like when we compare these two files. So you can see that the first offset starts off with the number zero because all files begin at byte zero and um, 
the second row starts at 104. And you can see that on the second file, we have the ending byte, so that the, the first row ends on 104, and then um, and so on. So, um, so essentially, if we now could could marry these two files up together, we can get the name of the file, the start offset, and the uh, and the ending offset. Uh, and just to show you that, having um, having added that last byte, we also have that that value three nine eight right at the end. So, in functional programming, you would use uh, a zip command to uh, merge these files together. And I was about to write one of these, and then I discovered the bash actually had it. It's called paste. Um, so that was fun. Uh, and you can see now we have the, uh, the file name, the byte offset, and the, the ending offset. So you might be wondering what, what good are these byte offsets? Um, and um, so if you've ever come across the dd command, uh, ooh, so I hadn't realized that um, uh, some of those are being hidden by the, uh, by the banner. Let me get rid of that. Apologies for that. Um, so the dd command I, I was terrified of because it's the, the um, command you get told to use to format your disk drive uh, in Linux. And it basically copies data from somewhere to somewhere else. So it can copy a whole lot of zeros onto your hard drive. But it can also just copy certain bytes of a particular file. So if we run this uh, command here, um, they will basically uh, go into the file, seek to a particular position and with a certain count, and they will just um, ex um, print out, insert, and into, depending on what these offsets are. So if we get one of these numbers from, uh, uh, from the output, we can actually see that, yes, that also has contains insert into uh, at that imp um at that value. And then we can do a little calculation just to get the, the count, because it turns out that um, uh, DD wants a count rather than an ending offset. And then we can run this code, which I'll, I'll, I'll set that off running, and then I'll, I'll go through it, because it looks a bit frightening. But it's basically iterating through that offsets file that we had, splitting the data up into the, the file, the from, and the to. It's doing that calculation for the count, and then it's doing its uh, uh, DD to, to get the thing. And I'm just running it twice so that I can um, so stop that, so that I can prove that each of these entries starts off with insert into and ends with a uh, semicolon. So, that, so that's definitely picked the right, um, the right uh, uh, areas. And so you might be wondering, is this really functional programming uh, as such? And I thought it, it actually is very much like some uh, functional data structures like um, piece tables. Uh, and also Erlang uh, does exactly the same thing with strings. Instead of constantly mutating it memory, and you can think of the file system as being a type of memory, um, by, by adding content into there, it can simply get a record of where content is to be found within the memory and then uh, concatenate that when you need to and send it off to whichever service, so in this case, uh, MySQL. And um, we're getting to the end of, uh, of, of my time, really, so I, I didn't have time to look into GNU Parallel, but this is an amazing um, bash um, uh, tool, uh, a frustrating and very annoying tool, um, but, but very, very powerful that lets you do kind of parallelism again on, on the command line. We, we use that to import these files into uh, into my SQL, so possibly uh, uh, the topic for another talk, uh, another time, and uh, so that's it for now. Thank you very much. Uh, my slides available on uh, on GitHub, um, and um, both myself and uh, Charlie is going to speak next. Are from Couchbase. If you fancy uh, working with us in technical writing or SDK or cloud development, do have a look or or, or reach out to us to uh, uh, say hello. Thank you. So let me just remove that. And I'm going to check if there are any comments and questions. Or apologies, everyone, for uh, for the spam, which I believe my colleagues are dealing with. Uh, Sam's uh, mentioned hadn't thought that Exargs was like map before. Yeah, it's 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 a really badly ugly spelt map, uh, kind of. Um, and. Uh, Okay, yes, uh, some stuff about Glamour's toolkit. So um, thank you very much for that. I'm going to now uh, invite uh, Charlie uh, onto the stream. Hello, Charlie. 
I... Right. So, uh, if you want to share your screen, then I'll bring that on. Should be it. Yeah, it's just... Uh, is that on? Ah, perfect. Lovely. Thank you very much, Charlie. Good luck. Okay, thanks, Akeem. All right, so I'm going to do a bit of a introduce, introduction demo of Couchbase Shell, which is a shell environment built on top of another shell environment called New Shell, which is also a scripting language in itself. So if we start kind of looking at the high level of New Shell, the general philosophy that they take is that they want to take something that most people who have worked in shells know, which is the Unix pipeline, and they want to modernize it. So what does modernizing the Unix pipeline mean? Well, it's easiest to show if I just run something like LS. So we can see that this is outputted in this nice table, which is structured data. And within new shell itself, all data from native commands is structured internally. So what this means is that we can really easily make these longer pipelines from the individual commands. And it's really easy to do. So each step, we know that the data is going to have structure and what we can do with it. So we can filter where the type is filed and then sort by the size really easily. And so with these simple commands, we can build up really quite complicated pipelines, which aren't actually very complex to work with. So for example, we can do a similar type of thing of what we've just done using group by. So group by type has then taken all our rows and put them into a file and do columns. It's put the table, it's kind of uh, rotated it here. So given this, we can then run a similar command to what we've already got. We're going to group by the type, get the file column, and then sort it by the size. So it's basically the same sort of thing as what we've just done in a different way. But let's go on and look at something using a bit more data. And this is kind of where we're going to bring in catch base a bit as well. So query is a catch base shell command. And we're going to select everything from this travel sample bucket, which is basically like a database, where the document field, where document is like a row, where the document field type is airport. And then we're going to save it into an airports.csv file. A new shell sees this CSV suffix and just automatically writes as a CSV file. So when we do that, that's now written our file. So if we take a look at that using the cat command, we can see that it's given us this big CSV file full of stuff, which we can kind of see a bit better if we use open. But we, we need to do something with this and actually make it usable. OK, so if we use a slightly more complicated pipeline, we can open our CSV file. We're going to filter where the time zone is like London. We're then going to update the ID column so that for each row, it's going to be the airport name hyphen city. We're going to remove the type column because we don't care about it. And then we're going to save that down as a JSON file. So once we've done that, we can then look at our JSON file. And it, it works. We, we've then got the same sort of thing, but we've only got things in the London time zone. And the IDs changed to what we wanted it to be. So if we then wanted to take this and put it back into catch base, that's really easy as well. We have got to do a little bit of stuff to get it into the right format for this Docker upset, but we won't really go into much detail on that because it's not very interesting. But there we go. We're, we're, it's just nice and simple. So if we move on to something kind of similar, but different, but let's look. So 
Couchbase has this concept of scopes, which is kind of like schemas in a relational database. So if we take a look at the scopes in our travel sample database, we can see we've got about six of them. And now let's say that we've just spun up a new database or bucket, then we want to migrate all of our scopes across into the bucket this new bucket, which is actually in a completely different cluster that's totally different. So we can run scopes. We're going to select the scope column. We're going to filter where the scope is not underscore default. Then for each scope, we're going to run the create command, which is going to take the scope name. And then we're going to run it against our dev.remote cluster. And there we go. It's as simple as that to do something as powerful as migrating things like these schemas or collections, which are like tables or index definitions, that kind of thing. So at this point, you might be thinking, well, that's great. But what about non-native commands? How do they work? So we can do something with git log. And Newshell has no knowledge of git at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to output it in this pretty format, which is going to be the Shea slash slash committer slash slash description slash slash date time of the commit, which is going to look like this, which is pretty difficult to read. But if we then use this pipeline, what we're going to do is we're going to take this output, we're going to run it through this lines command which for every line in this output is going to make a row. And then it's going to split each row into columns based on the slash slash. And we're going to end up with Shea one committer, desk, and merge that. So that'll look like this. And then once we've done this, we can just use this the same way as we've been doing things all along. So I'm just going to filter where the committer is me. And there we go. We've got it, just all of the commits that are by me. So as well as this sort of thing, New Shell also supports just writing custom commands straight in. So here we've written a double command, which takes a int argument. And then we're going to create a simple list. And then for each one, we're going to double the item. And that gives us this little table where one double is two and so on. And you may have noticed there that when I actually had the incorrect syntax, it gives you nice errors and tells you things in more detail. So as well as being able to do all this, it also supports uh, scripts. So this is what a script looks like. And in this case, it is once again a catch base specific one but with the new shell stuff as well. So we're going to create a variable called bucket names. And in new shell, all variables are immutable, which is kind of a rust influence as well as a bit of the syntax. And we're going to run the buckets command, which is going to fetch all of our buckets from our cluster. It's going to pull out the name column. And then we'll just have a list of all of our bucket names. We're then going to run this little function here kind of function, which is going to take each bucket name. And for each bucket name, it's going to run this buckets config command, which is a kind of low level command that gets a bunch of information about the bucket. And it's going to pull out this basic stats field from that. And then it's going to make a new table, which contains all per, per second. And that's about it. So if we run this first, oh, I just realized I missed a whole bit. but We'll do this first and then go back to that. So we're going to use this fake command, which creates fake data. And we're just going to run it twice just to create a load of data. Or maybe once because it's going slow. OK, so we've run that. So then if we run our ops per sec, there we go. We can see we've got our three buckets. And because we're running it as a travel sample, we can see it's going ops per second. So let's go back to this fake command here because I completely missed a part of my demo. So as well as this, Couchbase shell has a fake command for creating fake data. 
So this uses something called the Terra templating language. And here we're going to create a user. And this is going to be the document body here, which just contains things like name, username. And we're going to create a bunch of kind of fake order values, which is kind of like a purchase history. So if we run this, we can see we get an output that looks like this. And the reason why this is all duplicated so many times is because it's flattened out the order values into a, a row each. If we just did the single layer of flatten, you'd see it's a bit different because it's actually a list of items which are no longer flattened. So if we then take these and stick them in our database, then we can do things with that. Like we're going to once again run a query, but we're only going to select the order values. It's not going to work because we've changed the bucket. So if we change the bucket that we're running against. So it's going to select the order values. It's going to pull out the order values column. It's going to run a flatten. Then it's going to run this inbuilt reduce command to just make a total really. So if we run that, it's going to be broken. Okay, let's try it with the default. Okay, apparently I'm not allowed to do that. Oh, I see. No, I don't. Well, it would have reduced it down so that we just have a total of all the order values across all of the users if it hadn't decided to error, which for some reason it had. And that's about it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that and uh, and, and uh, for dealing uh, gracefully with the curse of the live demo. Um, so um, let's give you a nice uh, uh, low bar question uh, just to start off with from Sam, which is, do, do you use yourself Newtel day to day and what pain points have you found? Yeah, so I've been using New Shell as my daily shell for a long time now, over a year, possibly a year and a half, two. Uh, the pain points are mostly that everything's written for Bash and New Shell isn't Bash. Some things you, you try and copy and paste and they just don't work. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, you can't do something like echo hello and then write that to a file because it's, that, that's not the syntax in new shell you have to use something like save file uh, well, it's just echoing the whole lot but yeah that's amazing. Oh, sorry. you have to use pipelines for everything so there right. you go you have to use pipelines you can't use this okay. angle operator stuff like that it's just yeah, just a bit of difference. How, how often do you end up switching back to Bash in uh, frustration? Only when I need to use a GPG key to sign a tag okay. for Git. That's the only okay. time. Because I can't figure out how to do that. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Um, so, uh, so one of the sort of usability uh, one um, from uh, Dan, uh, uh, one of our speakers. Um, one of the big pros of using Bash pipelines is that they tend to be fast. And how does New Shell and Couch Shell compare to that? Yeah. So the performance of New Shell is yeah, it's good. It's kind of designed to be fast, and it's got um, you can parallelize things. I'm pretty sure it's got something called um data frames, which can, I don't know where they come from, but it supports data frames. So you can do things like streaming really large data sets without killing all your memory and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And 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 one question that I, 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 in a way, would have been lovely to preempt. Um, and, and I don't know whether you have a, a, a thought on this, uh, Charlie, but uh, what advantages does CouchShell have over PowerShell? So that's the Windows uh, um, scripting language, uh, which uses a similar system of streams of objects from, question from Andy. Well, an obvious example of where CouchBase shell has a advantage is you've got a load of CouchBase shell, uh -huh. uh, yes. a load of CouchBase commands, but, um, but new shell itself. Uh, 
I'm not sure. I'm not really familiar with PowerShell. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no good problem. That. PowerShell to me looks amazing, and then every time I speak to people about it, they've been like, oh, it's all right, yeah. So if, if, if anyone here or, or if anyone knows any PowerShell enthusiasts uh, who would like to give a talk to a, a friendly uh, group, then uh, then please do. And uh, so I think one, one last question uh, from James. What does New Shell do about errors? Is it code like Bash or some other? In fact, you mentioned errors, didn't you? Uh, yeah, so... It's a very recent update, which changed everything, uh, has introduced error codes. I haven't looked into it into a lot of detail yet, but I know that it has introduced error codes so that you can detect when a command has failed and stuff like that in your script. Amazing. Well, that's uh, good stuff. So, and then uh, final comment uh, from Dan, PowerShell talk will be cool. So all you .NET people listening, debate us, you cowards. Uh, we, we expect your talk uh, submission soon. So um, thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, from uh, um, from Charlie, Dan, uh, Veit, and myself, um, if you'd like to join us on, uh, on Discord, uh, which I will also uh, paste shortly into the uh, chat, um, then please do. And hopefully some of us will be uh, around there to answer any other questions you've got. And uh, Thank you very much. Good night. Night, Charlie.